The Bible says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Crooked thinking is crowding our thinking. Think about it. Crooked thinking about sin is just sinful. Crooked thinking about the Word is growing worse. This is why in Genesis 1 through 11, we have these foundational truths that will equip us and encourage us and enable us to straighten out our crooked thinking. An opening line of a song, opening line of a book, an opening line of a, of a movie, an opening line, it can, it can arrest your attention. It can uh, capture your curiosity. It can ignite your interest. Opening line of a book can lure you in. Take a closer look. I, some of you sent me uh, your favorite opening line of a book. I want to share some of these, see if you recognize them. In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. The hobbit, that's right. Call me Ishmael, Moby Dick. It was the best of times. It was the tale of two cities, of course. Once upon a time, that's probably been opening line in a myriad of books, right? This is my favorite book in all the world, though I've never read it, The Prince's Bride. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Pride and prejudice. If you're interested in happy endings, you better, you'd be better off reading some other book, a series of unfortunate events. Where's Papa going with that axe? Charlotte's Web. All children except one grow up. Peter Pan, there was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Maybe you are familiar with this opening line or opening lines. Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics, died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it's our turn to study statistical mechanics. That's kind of an alarming opening line, isn't it? That is the opening line apparently to a book called Thermodynamics and Statistical Mechanics. Somebody sent that in. <laughs> opening lines are important. In in fact, good books have good opening lines, right? How about the, the best-selling book of all time? What is the opening line of the best-selling book of all time? In the beginning. That's right, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this Sunday, we're starting this series called Don't Get It Twisted, Straightening Out Crooked Thinking. We're going to walk through Genesis 1 through Genesis 11. And today, we're starting with a message entitled, Start Here. Start Here. We're going to start where it all started. We're going to start here in Genesis 1, verse number 1. You say, why start here? Well, uh, you know this. The Bible says that we are to save ourselves from this crooked generation. And you know how crooked things have gotten. I mean, I don't have to tell you this. Uncommon sense has replaced common sense, right? Right has replaced wrong. Wrong has replaced right. Crooked thinking has replaced critical thinking. We ought to be critical thinkers. God made you to love Him with all your mind. You ought to be using your mind. You ought to be critically thinking. But critical thinking has been replaced by crooked thinking. Crooked thinking about God. Crooked thinking about man. Crooked thinking about creation crooked thinking about family or marriage or gender there's a lot of crooked thinking about the sanctity of life about eternity about heaven or hell just, there's a lot of crooked thinking out there and so Genesis 1 through 11 is going to help us straighten out some of that crooked thinking so today I pray that the Holy Spirit will drop into your heart uh, the main idea the thrust of this message which I've worded this way cancel crooked thinking about the creator we're going to start with the creator and we're going to pray that the holy spirit will begin to straighten out our crooked thinking and when you think of straighten out think of it this way where you have a question mark 
right? A question mark is kind of crooked, isn't it? Where you have a question mark, pray that God would straighten that out and make an exclamation point. Pray that. Pray that he would drop into your heart the ability to cancel the crooked thinking you have about him, about the creator. And there's a lot of crooked thinking out there about where we came from, about creation and the creator. So if we're going to cancel crooked thinking about the creator, there's some beliefs we need to believe. And in fact, I would encourage all of us to cancel crooked thinking about the creator quickly like fast and furiously we need to cancel crooked thinking about the creator faster than tanya can figure out a way to spend money we need to cancel crooked thinking about the creator faster than we cancel that live stream service before the free trial ends we need to cancel crooked thinking about the creator faster than people buying those brisket sandwiches at bucky's we need to cancel crooked thinking about the Creator faster than Hendon Hooker is hooking up with Jalen Hyatt for another touchdown. Straighten it out, church. Amen? Get rid of crooked thinking. Cancel the crooked thinking we have about the Creator. And the way we do that is in Genesis 1-1. There, there's three beliefs here that we need to embrace. Number one, God is the Creator. We need to embrace that belief that God is. What God says here is God is. The I am is saying here, I am. And if the I am says He is, He is. If God the Creator says He is, He is. And that's what he's saying. In the beginning, God. God is the creator. I love how the Bible opens. It opens with an invitation. I love this. In. Think of the word in. In the beginning. This is the greatest opening line because we have an open door. And we're invited into the the autobiography of all autobiography. Who likes to read autobiographies? This is the autobiography of all autobiographies. This is the book of all books, the story of all stories, the truth of all truths, right here. And we're invited in. You can't get to any other part of the Bible unless you enter in right here in the beginning. You have to enter in here, in the beginning. When you open the Bible, you're opening the mouth of God. When you open the Bible, you're opening the very voice of God. When God speaks, the Bible speaks. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. And when the Bible speaks, it speaks about what is right and true. In fact, the Bible is the greatest commentary on the Bible. And the Bible says of the Bible that all your precepts are right. That's what Psalm 119 says. All your precepts are right. Jesus said in the priestly prayer, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. So God is saying that when the Bible speaks, it speaks about what is right and true. Right and true. Right and true. So when the Bible speaks about authority, it's right and true. When the Bible speaks about calamity, it's right and true. When the Bible speaks about eschatology, the last days, it's right and true. When the Bible speaks of eternity, heaven and hell, it's right and it's true. When the Bible speaks of history or glory or identity, it is right and it is true. When the Bible speaks of soteriology, the study of salvation, or theology, the study of God, it's right and it is true. When it speaks about prophecy, it's right and true. You can trust the truth. It is right and it is true. And this is helpful because we've got these big questions that we're asking. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Man, what's wrong with the world? And... and, What is the solution to what's wrong with the world? All those questions are answered right here in Genesis 1 through 11. And we notice from the very beginning that in the beginning, God. I love how the Bible starts off. We're introduced to God from the beginning. The Bible doesn't start with man. It starts with God. It doesn't start with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is not the beginning of the Bible. God is the beginning. Doesn't start with Adam and Eve. Doesn't start with Cain and Abel. Doesn't start with Abraham and Sarah. Doesn't start with Moses and Joshua or David and Solomon or Peter and Paul. It starts with God. In the beginning, God. From the very beginning, the Bible is telling us what the Bible's all about. God. You know the most used word in the Bible? 
Most used word from Genesis to Revelation is God. In fact, it's used 32 times in these opening 31 verses. If you count the pronouns, 48 times in 31 verses. From the very starting point. The point of the Bible is that we are not the point. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. Scientists say our universe is heliocentric. Helio meaning sun, S-U-N. And the sun is the center of everything. And everything revolves around the sun. Well, we come to our culture today. And it's an egocentric culture. It's an I-centered culture. We want God to revolve around us. But we come to the Bible. The Bible's not egocentric. It's not I-centered. The Bible's not meocentric. It's not me-centered. The Bible's not weocentric. It's not we-centered. The Bible is theocentric. It's God-centered. And when scientists begin to figure out, hey, the sun is the center of the universe, then the universe begins to make sense. Same with our lives. And we begin to understand, hey, I'm not the center of my universe. God is. And if you can get there, what begins to happen is things begin to make sense in your family and in parenting and in your marriage and in your life and in your career and in your faith. You begin to see, okay, it's not about me. God isn't revolving. I'm not the center and God revolving around me. God's the center. All of existence is about God. It doesn't read in the beginning America or in the beginning the church or in the beginning Signal Mountain or in the beginning Chattanooga or in the beginning Red Bank or in the beginning America. It says in the beginning God starts with Him. You and I are not the center of our universe. God is. But we say things like, well, I didn't like that today or I didn't like this today. I didn't like that about worship today. I didn't like this about worship today. I didn't like the way we did that. I didn't like the way we did that. Well, guess what? That Whatever it is, the song or whatever it is, it's not for you. It's for Him. Life doesn't revolve around you and what you want and what you think and what's comfortable to you. It doesn't work that way. In the beginning, God, He's the center, not you. In the beginning, God. And the word for God here, the name for God is Elohim. Somebody say Elohim. Yeah, th- this, this name means superior one, the one true God. It speaks of his, his, the power of his spoken word. And it's fascinating that this Elohim is in the plural form. Not singular, but plural. Though it is attached to a singular verb, created. It's fascinating. What does that tell us? Well, what are we? One, two, three, four words into the Bible? And we're already being taught about the triune God? That there's one God who exists eternally in three persons? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? And when you and I as a believer, when we say God, what we're saying is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Because He's one God who has revealed Himself in three persons exist all of eternity in three persons triune means three in one or I like this a little better three yet one now trinity that word doesn't appear in scripture but the triune God is all over scripture in fact in this chapter and down in verse 26 Elohim says let us make man in our own image and three times there it's used in the plural form the trinity is all over scripture this is what separates us from the 4,200 plus religions of the world is that we believe in the triune God, that there's one God in three persons. That separates us from these 42 plus hundred religions. Yeah, they may believe in some kind of God, but they don't believe in a God who saves. They don't believe in a triune God, God the Father, who, who was the architect of salvation and loved us so much That he didn't want to leave us in our brokenness and in our sin. So he sent God the Son, Jesus, to live a sinless life and die a sinner's death and be raised from the dead in order that God the Holy Spirit could come live inside of us. This is what we believe. And he has revealed himself in the person of Christ. I want you to listen to what Jesus said in John 5. Listen to this. Jesus says, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me. If you believe Moses, you'll believe me. Now think about it. Moses wrote Genesis. 
Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Moses wrote Genesis. He wrote Genesis 1-1. He wrote Genesis 1-11. through So you can take literally Genesis 1-11 through and, and you can insert that into John 5. And In the beginning, or rather for if you believed in Genesis 1-11, through if you believed in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, then you would believe my words, Jesus says. If you believe... Genesis 1 through 11, then you would believe me because it writes of me. If you do not believe in Genesis 1 through 11, how will you be able to believe my words? In John 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus, for the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we can take that word, Word, and replace it with Jesus. And it can read this way. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Jesus, and without Jesus was not anything made that was made. Colossians, you can do the same thing. For by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, and visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. Revelation 4.11, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Psalm 51 tells us, King David says, create in me a clean heart. That this one who created the universe, he can recreate you. He can give you a new heart. He can give you a new life. He can renew a right spirit within you. I love what Loretta Lynn said when she was asked the question by a Chicago TV announcer. He asked Loretta Lynn, he said, why do you call President Richard Nixon Richard? Why do you call him Richard? She said, well, they called Jesus Jesus, didn't they? If they call the creator of the world Jesus, I think I can call the leader of the free world Richard. When we speak the name Jesus, we are speaking the name of the creator God. He has revealed himself in the person of Christ. God is the creator. Second belief we're going to have to embrace, we're going to have to believe, if we're going to cancel our crooked thinking about the Creator, is secondly, God is the Creator who created. His name is attached to this this verb, created, in verse 1. In the beginning, God created. What a statement. This doesn't read, in the beginning, God apologized for the truth. (laughs) Hey, church, we need to stop apologizing for the truth. God doesn't apologize for the truth. Yes, he, he, he came full of grace and truth, but he didn't apologize for the truth. It doesn't read in the beginning, God defended himself. God doesn't need us to defend him. He wants us to depend on him. This doesn't read in the beginning, God debated his existence. It doesn't read that way. In fact, this is presented in such a matter-of-fact way, with no philosophical or no logical reasoning to believe it. It's just stated as fact. In the beginning, God created. And with these, where are we here? One, two, three, four, five words into the Bible. Five words. And God has already wiped away atheism agnosticism, skepticism by asserting his existence. From the beginning, he sweeps it away. God deals a fatal blow to Buddhism and Hinduism and Mormonism and polytheism by declaring himself to be the one true God. He destroys pantheism, materialism, individualism, naturalism, evolutionism by from the very beginning separating himself from his creation as the creator. I mean, from the, we're five words in. Five words into the Bible. And the Lord has annihilated all the isms. They're gone. Five words in. He created. This word created is B-A-R-A in the Hebrew. It's bara. It's, it's a masculine singular verb. Implying he created. Like if you go to the original Hebrew text and you were to read it in its order, because the Hebrew order is different from our English order, it would read Elohim. 
In the beginning, He created. Did you hear what the Bible says? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in the beginning, He created. One God, three persons. Incredible. Right from the beginning. This word created means He initiated. He created. He caused a new activity to occur. He made what was made out of nothing. And we call it instantaneous creation. That there's a creator who out of nothing created everything. It has a double meaning. It means completely effortless. That God was completely effortless in creating creation. And completely out of nothing. We can say it like this. It was nothing for God to create everything out of nothing. There was nothing for Him to do that. This, this word occurs seven times in the creation account. And, and there's, we can learn a lot by this verb. For instance, it only always has as its subject God. God is always its subject. Meaning God is the only one who creates. Man can make. We can take stuff that exists and make something. We can fashion something. But we can't create anything. God is the creator. So the verb is always, its subject is always God. It conveys that God alone is the creator. It always refers to the product that's being created. Not to anything that was used to create it because remember there was nothing used to create it he created it out of nothing think about it like this you order a piece of furniture ship get shipped to your house it comes with 745 billion parts with one tool one little wrench to do all the parts right and you've got all the parts laid out and the paper there's a lot of focus on all the stuff that it takes to put that piece of furniture together. But when this verb is used in the creation account, it never refers to any of it. It only refers to the product being created. Why? Because he created it out of nothing. Absolutely nothing. I mean, all things, all people have their ultimate origin in God as the only creator. One has said it like this, without a right understanding of our origins we'll have a wrong understanding of ourselves. If we don't have a right understanding of our origins, we will only have a wrong understanding of ourselves. You say, well, okay, creation is in Genesis. That's great. Is it anywhere else in the Bible? Oh, my. You can go to every book of the Bible. It's in nearly every book. Nehemiah chapter 9. You alone are the Lord. You alone. You have made heaven. The heaven of heavens with all their host. The earth and all that's on it. The seas and all that's in them. And you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. Remember when Job in Job 38. When God answered Job. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I'll question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Jeremiah 32, all Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. Acts 17, Paul says to those who seem to be very religious, he says this, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And we could go on and on and on in scripture. Francis Schaeffer said it like this, creation is as historically real as the history of the Jews and our own present moment of time. Both the Old and the New Testament, both of them, deliberately root themselves back into the early chapters of Genesis, insisting that they are a record of historical events. Now, if that seems too far-fetched for you, if it's too far-fetched for you to embrace 
the truth that there's a creator who created creation. If that's too hard for you to understand, there's an alternative. It's not a good alternative, but instead of instantaneous creation, which is there's a creator who created everything out of nothing, there's another view called spontaneous creation. And this is a view that says that creation just happened. There was nothing, then a big bang, and then there was everything. I read about a Christian who used to be an atheist. Here's what he said. He used to hold to that spontaneous creation view. And this is what he said. I just, I just didn't have enough faith to keep believing that. I, I just didn't have enough. People make fun of Christians for believing in a God who created the universe, but their alternative is no alternative at all. You've seen those social media memes where it says how, how it started. There's a picture of the past and how it's going, picture of the present. Science speaks to how things are operating in the universe. Science can't, has really nothing to say about the origin, just how it's going, not how it started. But the truth, the scripture, the Bible, God himself gives us the, in the beginning God created. Quite frankly, it, it takes a mountain of faith to not believe in the creator. And if that's you, if you say, man, I just can't, I just cannot believe there's a creator who created creation. I envy you and I'm jealous of your faith because I'll never have that much faith it takes a mountain of faith to believe there's not a creator and praise God the word of God tells us it only takes a mustard seed of faith to believe and I'm thankful that it only takes a mustard seed of faith because that's all I can muster and that's all it takes to believe in a creator that's all it takes to believe in a God who loves us and who's done everything necessary to save us. Albert Einstein, one day his students in his class informed him that they had decided there is no God. So he asked them, how, how much of the world's knowledge do you believe that you have? So they did some calculations and discussed it and discussed it and did some calculations. And they came up with 5%. They said, we believe that we have 5% of the world's knowledge. He thought that was a little too high. A lot too high. But he indulged them and he said, okay. Then he asked them this question. Is it possible that God exists in the other 95% that you do not have? See, for you to say that you reject the creation account, for you to say that you reject Genesis 1 and 2, for you to say you reject Genesis 1 through 11, and yet ignore the rest of what the Bible has to say about creation, that is irresponsible, that is disingenuous, Quite frankly, that's hypocritical of you to say something like that. It, to reject this simple, straightforward truth, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's not only hypocritical, it's dangerous. It, it's fatal. Here's what Paul says happens to people who reject this straightforward, simple truth. In Romans 1, he tells us what happens. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. He gave them over to a debased mind. In the beginning, God was not created. He is the creator. He doesn't have a beginning and an end. He is the beginning and the end. He is infinite, not finite. The psalmist Tell us from, from, you can start at Psalm 40 and go all the way to Psalm 147 and it talks about God being infinite in faithfulness and infinite in grace and infinite in forgiveness and infinite in wisdom. He's an infinite God. He is the one who defines evil and good and good and evil. The majority does not define that. We live in a culture and a world today that would rather do evil than judge evil because they've got it twisted. They're thinking good is evil and evil is good. Only God defines that. God is the only one who defines marriage. 
No government defines that. God is the only one that defines justice. No activist group can define that. Only God does. Only God defines history. World leaders don't define that. Only God defines sin. Psychologists don't define that. Only God defines joy and peace and happiness. Not your feelings. Not how you feel. God is the creator who created and he continues to create. He continues to recreate. He continues to make. He is a make all things new God. That's who he is. Here's the third belief we're going to have to embrace if we're going to cancel our crooked thinking. Number three, last part of this verse. You see it there, verse one. The heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created. Well, what did he create? The heavens and the earth. Well, what is meant by the heavens and the earth? Creation. So number three, God is the creator who created creation. These two words are opposite words, heaven and earth. And they're used here to communicate the totality of creation. The whole universe. From the heavens to the earth. When you think of heavens, think of space. When you think of the earth, think of matter. So from space to matter. From heavens to the earth, the totality of the entire universe was created by God himself. The opening line of the Bible. I'm telling you, this is a very polarizing and controversial verse. It's polarizing. It's as polarizing as candy corn. Candy corn is the the cryptocurrency of Halloween candy. Either you love it or you hate it. You're all in or you're all out. This, this opening line, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it's, it's more controversial than saying apple cinnamon is better than pumpkin spice or vice versa. It's divisive. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Think of our Milky Way. 200 billion stars. What? How do you even fathom that? Our closest neighboring galaxy. 12 trillion miles away what the Hubble telescope has a lot to tell us scientists say that recently I read that the Hubble telescope has revealed that the galaxies are moving away from our galaxy interesting this Hubble telescope has 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 helped scientists discover hey the universe is continually constantly expanding you know what that means the fact of an expanding universe means that there had to be a starting point there had to be a beginning that there had to be an an origin that there had to be a, a genesis there had to be an In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In fact, Psalm 19 says it like this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare it. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Their voice goes out through all the earth. So both the heavens and the earth are proclaiming His handiwork. Both the heaven and the earth are declaring the glory of God. Herbert Spencer was a well-known scientist in his day. He died in 1903. But Spencer discovered that all of existence can be contained in five categories. Count them. One, two, three, four, five. Somebody say five. All right, here they are. You ready? Time, force, action, space, matter. This is a scientist. Died in 1903. And in his life, he discovered that all of existence, all of creation can be contained in five categories. Time, force, action, space, matter. Well, listen to this. In the beginning, that's time. God, that's force. Created, that's action. The heavens, that's space. And the earth, that's matter. Who knew? God knew. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You say, okay, okay. 
Pastor, I, I, I understand that. Let's say that's true. What does that have to do with me today? I mean, honestly. It's the year 2022. I'm just trying to survive. I'm trying to earn a living. I'm trying to provide for my family. My marriage is on the rocks. My, my health is growing worse. My, my, my career is tanking. I've been laid off. This relationship is in shambles over here. Everything seems to be falling apart in my life. What, why does this even matter? Why are you wasting time on Genesis 1 verse 1? Well, let's think about for a moment the implications of creation. If indeed this is true, are there implications for us today? Well, let's think through some of these. I'm not going to give you all of them, but here's a few. If God created creation, if indeed he created creation, that means that he is sovereign over creation. Amen? If he created creation, if he made it, do you agree he's in control of it? That he's sovereign over it? You believe that? Yes, if he made it, he's in control of it. So if there's a creator who created creation, I love what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8. If God created creation, then everything that was created is under his control. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Nothing, nothing, nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of the creator in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. And that all started in Genesis 1.1. Here's another implication. If God is the creator, if that is indeed true, if he made all things, Colossians says he made all things, and he's before all things, well then how foolish to have any other gods before him. How foolish is it to say that there is no God, and and only the fool says that, and how foolish is it to have other gods before the creator God. Here's another one. If God made you, then your body is his body. My body, my choice is a lie from the pit of hell. If God gave you this tent that you're in, it's his. It's not yours. He made it. You belong to him. You're made in his image, not your own image. You're not the point. He's the point. You're not the center. He's the center. If God made you, here's another one. If God made you in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them, then guess what? Your gender, your gender is not some random decision that you need to make. Your gender is an assignment assigned to you by God Almighty. And if you reject that basic truth, here's what you're rejecting. When you say, I've got to decide what gender I'm going to be, it's, it's not been assigned to me. I have to make that decision, random, this random decision. Here's what, if you reject your assigned gender, you are rejecting the very basic, the very basic purpose of life that God has given to you. That's the base level. If indeed he created you. These, these are implications for us. Here's another one. If God made you, then you are not insignificant. I don't care what a circumstance, how a circumstance makes you feel. I don't care what somebody says to you. I don't care what a, how a circumstance makes you feel. If you are made by God, you are not insignificant. You matter to Him. Period. Here's another one. If God made you, then your life has meaning and purpose. If you're just a mass of matter, you don't have any meaning. You don't have any purpose. What does it matter? What does morality matter if if you don't have a maker? What what does life matter if you don't have a maker? But because you do, you, you have a purpose. You were made on purpose, and you have a purpose. If indeed God made you, then he longs to make you new. 
He is not only the creator God, he's not only the the center of all things, and he's not only the creator God, he's the redeeming God. He made you, he wants to remake you, he wants to make you new. And and, and we see that in Genesis 3.15. Here's a promise from God Almighty. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. He's talking to the serpent there. That the Lord will crush him. The Lord will destroy him. One day throw him into the lake of fire forever. Yet Satan, the serpent, he will bruise the Lord's heel, meaning the crucifixion, but it didn't stop the Lord because he was raised from the dead. So here you have this creation account that God made Adam and Eve, put them in this incredible garden of Eden, said you can eat from anything in this garden, just don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They disobey God, they ignore God, Eve was deceived, Adam outright sinned, they took the fruit, they ate the fruit, and they became broken separated from God and ever since then every family since has been broken and separated from God but God made a promise he made a promise in Genesis 3 that he would bring the seed of the woman and through the seed of the woman we would be set free and so what did God do he raised up a nation what nation did he raise up Israel why did he raise up Israel for one reason what was the reason to bring forth Messiah to bring forth the anointed one to bring Jesus the sinless one who lived a sinless life lived a life we could never live died a death we should have all died on the cross paying the penalty of our sin was buried and raised to life this good news is promised to us God is a redeeming God. He made you and he longs to remake you and give you a new heart and give, make a, renew a right spirit within you and give you a clean heart and give you purpose and give you hope and joy and peace. In the beginning, Jesus, this creator, he knew that you'd be hearing this message. He orchestrated you hearing this today and he wants you to know that he loves you. And he sent his son to die for you. And if you will believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and was raised from the dead and you confess him as Lord, you'll be saved today. If you trust him and turn to him and believe, you can be forgiven of your sins. Your sins will be forgotten. You'll become a part of God's family today if you believe. 